All right. Good evening. Good morning. Oh, see, I got someone <laughs> who, who said good morning. Oh, my own daughter. That doesn't count. We'll try, we'll try that again. There's no reason you should be asleep at this point unless you've had a long, hard day at work. But good evening. Good evening. All right. Hey, welcome to High Hill Christian Church. I want to remind you, if you're new here, uh, we have a gift that we'd like to give to you, and there's some car, a card that we'd like for you to fill out at Connecting Point, uh, and so we can give that new gift to you. I'm excited to uh, have you join us this evening as we continue our conversation on the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, and tonight we're sitting family style, which is not our normal setup, but we're sitting around tables because we are in a series on the Jewish roots of our faith, and we're exploring the major feasts found in Scripture, and when they celebrated these feasts, they always celebrated them together as a family, so you are sitting together as a family for that reason. If you were with us this past Sunday, uh, we talked about matzah, or unleavened bread, and you'll find that message, if you missed it, on our YouTube channel. And then on Wednesday night, we were able to celebrate a uh, Passover Seder together with over 70 people here uh, that night, which was awesome. And if you would like a copy of the Haggah, or the Seder Guide, we have some of those available at the Resource Hub when you leave tonight. Uh, so, we're going to jump into today's message. We're going to be in the book of Matthew for most of the night. So go ahead and grab your Bible and open up to the book of Matthew. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles on the tables around you. But we're going to be in Matthew, which is a New Testament book. It's a gospel. It's in the back half of the Bible. And we're going to primarily uh, be in Matthew starting in chapter 21, which is where we started uh, this last Sunday, as we started talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <clears throat> so when you're in Matthew, you're looking for big number 21, and that's where we will be. I'm going to start by summarizing a little bit um, so that you have a timeline to reference. Uh, there's also plenty of verse references in your bulletin. So the top part of the, the note section of your bulletin, I've given you all the verse references that I'll be covering tonight in the order that I will be covering them. So you can walk along uh, with us as you uh, read, or you can also look at it later this week. Tonight, specifically, I'm going to talk about the Last Supper, or probably better called the Last Seder. But I want you to have a good understanding about the week of Jesus' life leading up to this meal. So starting in Matthew 21, Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem. It is a Sunday, and the crowd has gone wild. They are celebrating and welcoming, welcoming Jesus into the temple city as a king. But he also enters as the Passover lamb. And uh, Andy Johnson this week asked me a question about uh, the timeline of Holy Week. And I'm glad he did, because I've spent a long time studying it, trying to do some Passover math. Uh, and I want you to know that it's hard for us to determine the exact days that everything happened, because the Gospel writers weren't really concerned um, on a day-to-day -day timeline. So it's going to be a little bit challenging, but I'm going to uh, walk you through the timeline based on church tradition and when we get to the last Seder, I will give you my thoughts on that day based on my study this week. So Jesus enters the city on what we call Palm Sunday. The next day is Monday. Jesus enters into the temple and he's hunting for hametz or leaven in his father's house. And so Jesus cleanses the temple, removing all the leaven and sin that he finds. And then on Tuesday, he goes back to the temple. And in the temple, he's being questioned by the religious leaders. And I, I want to look at that for just a moment, starting in Matthew chapter 21, verse 23 through 27. It says this, And when he, Jesus, entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching. And they asked this question, By what authority are you doing these things? And who has given you this authority? And Jesus answered, I will also ask you one question. 
And if you can tell me the answer, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or was it from man? And they discussed it among themselves and they said, well, well if we say it's from heaven, he will say, well, then why didn't you believe him? But, but if we say it's from man, then we are afraid of the crowd for they, will hold, they all hold John as a prophet. And so they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. See, it was the Sanhedrin's responsibility, the religious leader's responsibility to know the difference between who was a true and who was a false prophet. But they tell Jesus, well, we don't know. We don't know if John was a true prophet or a false prophet. See, they're trying to force Jesus to say that his divine power was from God. If Jesus said that, then they could charge him with blasphemy and even have him arrested. But Jesus knew their motives, so he agreed to answer their questions if they could first answer his question about John the Baptist's work, whether it was human or divine. If it was divine, John had preached that Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God. He was divine. But if John's work was human, then those who followed John would riot. So religious leaders, their goal was to discredit Jesus. So then Jesus goes on to tell a few parables, one that you should look at before Sunday because it connects to what we're talking about on Sunday as we study the Feast of first fruits, is the parable of the tenants in Matthew chapter 21, verse 33 through 44. So I would encourage you to read that this week. But all throughout Matthew 22, the religious leaders try to trap Jesus, and they can't. And then in Matthew 23, Jesus pronounces judgment on the religious leaders. And then at the end, we see this beautiful passage in Matthew 23 as Jesus tells us of his heart that is broken for God's people. He says this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophet and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered you, your children together, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you are not willing. So your house has left you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus goes up to the Mount of Olives, which overlooks the temple, and he sits down. And his disciples come to him and they ask him two questions, two really important questions, because they're questions that we often ask today. The questions are this. Tell us, Jesus, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? So those are two questions we wrestle with often. Jesus, when are you coming back? And what's the sign that you're going to give us so that we know? Then the rest of Matthew 24 and 25 Jesus begins to speak prophetically, answering these questions in what is commonly called the Olivet Discourse. And that's where we pick up in Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 1. It says this, <clears throat> When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered together in the high priest's house, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest we cause an uproar among the people. And that's when we move into Wednesday. And we find Judas entering the plot with the religious leaders. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I will deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment on, he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke all indicate that this meal we're going to talk about tonight is the Last Supper, or like I said, better said, the Last Seder. That it was in fact the Passover meal. And Christian tradition puts that day as Thursday. And the meal would normally have included 
a lamb, like we ate at our Passover Seder on Wednesday, which was sacrificed on the day of Passover with a great ceremony at the temple. So I think, since the day began at sundown, and this is where the Passover math came in this week, since the day began at sundown, according to the Jewish calendar, this seems to tell us that Jesus possibly celebrated the Passover meal on Thursday at sundown, some hours before the Jews would have traditionally ate it. And it seems likely that this Passover meal that Jesus ate with his disciples didn't include a lamb because the lamb was not yet sacrificed. But they did have the lamb of God with them at the table. See, according to the Jewish custom, most people would eat their meal at the end of the 14th day of Nisan. But Christ ate his meal at the beginning of the 14th day, which would have been Thursday evening. So Christ ate the Passover on the same day as the other Jews, but not at the same hour. And we get this clue from John 19.31. Jesus is hanging on the cross, and John says this in his Gospel, Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. See, this was a special Sabbath because Passover, which is a day of rest, it is a Sabbath, happened the day before the weekly Sabbath. So two Sabbaths in a row. That's a special Sabbath. It doesn't happen very often. And so they took extra care and extra preparation for that Sabbath because it was so special. So let's look at this meal because I want to show you some powerful connections to the Passover meal, communion, and Jesus' death. Now, we already talked about matzah on Sunday, unleavened bread, which represents Jesus' body. But tonight, I want to talk to you about the cup of wine. At every Passover Seder, there was not one cup of wine. There was actually four cups per person. And each of these cups had a very specific name and a very specific meaning that connected to four decrees that Pharaoh made against the Hebrew people when they were slaves in Egypt. But these four cups also connected to four promises that God gave his people. The meal that Jesus ate, Passover, was created to remember and celebrate the journey of freedom from slavery in Egypt. And the Pharaoh had made four decrees. Here's what they are. The first one is this. He made their lives bitter with hard service. He said of every, every child born, if it is a son you shall kill it. Decree number three, Pharaoh commanded all of his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile. And then decree number four, he said, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. So the four cups of the Seder meal symbolize These four decrees from Pharaoh, but more than that, they symbolize four promises that God gave his people as a result of Pharaoh's decrees. Four promises of God to the people of Israel that would counteract Pharaoh's decrees. And we find these promises in the book of Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Here's what it says. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out. From under the burdens of the the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment, and I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. See, these promises represent four stages of redemption. They are progressive in nature. And each of these cups shows up in Jesus' life. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification. And it corresponds to God's promises that he will bring his people out. I chose this clay cup because sanctification is a process. We talked about this in January during our Heart for the House series. And this clay cup reminds me of Isaiah 64, verse 8. It says, But now, O Lord, You are our Father. We are the clay. And You are the potter. 
We're all a work of your hands. And so when we drink this first cup at the Passover Seder, we are, our response should be, God, make us holy. Set us apart for your plans and your purposes for our lives. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 tells us, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you were not receiving mercy, but now you have received mercy. So we are set apart to tell others of God's goodness. And we also see this cup represented in Mary. When the angel appears to her and says that she will be set apart for a holy purpose to be the mother of God in the flesh, Luke chapter 1, verse 28 through 38 says this, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. This is the angel speaking to Mary. She was greatly troubled and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary, being a common person, responds to the angel and says, How can this be? I'm just a regular person, and I'm a virgin. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child will be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. Behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her old age, as she, is also conbear, con, she has also conceived a son in the sixth month, even though she was called barren. For nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departs from her. So this first cup is the cup of sanctification. We are set apart for a holy purpose. Now the second cup, <clears throat> the second cup is the cup of deliverance. It corresponds with God's promise to free his people. And I've chosen this stone cup because the cup of deliverance is also known as the cup of plagues. And after each of the nine plagues in Scripture, it tells us that Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not let God's people go. This deliverance cup reminds us that we are not only redeemed by God, but he did so with great signs and wonders. This is the cup that Jesus spoke about when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane as he, after he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. It says in Matthew 26, 42, he being Jesus went away a second time and praying said, my father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink from it, your will be done. See, Jesus drank the cup of judgment for us. The third cup is the cup of redemption. And this cup connects to the promise that God will redeem His people. This cup reminds us of the blood of the Passover lamb that Israel put on their doorposts so that the death angel would pass over them. This cup is also known as the Messiah's cup. This is the cup that Jesus used to institute the Lord's Supper or communion. So I'm going to read that passage to you tonight. And on your table, you're going to find some little cups of matzah. I want you to go ahead and get one of those for each one of you. And you can already go ahead and grab yourself a cup and pour yourself a glass, but don't drink it yet. Because in a moment, we're going to share communion together. All right, so everybody get your little piece of matzah. You can already open up your little cup if you would like and pull out your matzah piece. I'm going to read to you 
from Matthew chapter 26. When Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, He says this in Matthew 26, verse 26 through 28. It says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, the matzah, and after blessing it, He broke it and He gave it to His disciples and said, Take and eat. This is My body. So if you have your matzah ready, go ahead and take it with me. And then Jesus took the cup, and when He had given thanks, He gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is My blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When you've got your juice ready, go ahead and take it with me. On Good Friday... We focus on the death of Jesus on the cross. But each week at our church, we have an opportunity to take communion. And when we do, when we take communion together with the saints, we have an opportunity to participate, to sit at the table for a moment with Jesus at this last Seder and celebrate His sacrifice in our place for our sins. That is what this third cup represents. Now on your table, you're going to find a bag that has some little black crosses on it. Mine is white, but <laughs> you have a bunch of black crosses. Go ahead and pull one of those crosses out for each one of you. And you're also going to need your little stick. Okay, So everybody's going to need a black cross and a little stick. Okay, Don't do anything with it. You'll, you'll use the strings later if you want, but the black cross and the stick is what's going to be important. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to use the stick. You'll see it looks kind of like a pencil, maybe has a point on one end. I want you to take that wooden stick and I want you to scratch in. This is where we're going to get real personal here. These are not my sins. Uh, <laughs> I want you to scratch in some of your sins into the cross. Go ahead and write them with the stick like you would write with a pen. Right? We're going to get real personal. Just write out your sins and scratch away just a little of that black cloth. Now, don't decorate your cross. Don't start scratching away other things. Just take your little cross and you can write things in your cross using your little wooden stick. Okay? You're going to press probably a little bit hard. Well, go ahead and just take a moment and, and write out some of your sins. You know, don't, don't show your neighbor. It's kind of a private thing, <laughs> right? But go ahead and write out some of your cross, or some of your sins on your cross. And, and when you're done doing that, just go ahead and set it down. We're going to come back to it here in a moment. Because there's one more cup that we need to talk about tonight. It's the fourth cup of Passover and it's the cup of acceptance or thanksgiving. And it connects to God's promises that He will take us to be His own people. It's known as the Halal Cup because it is drunk with psalms and praises. This is the cup that Jesus talks about right after He institutes the Lord's Supper. Right after He holds the cup up and says, this is My blood of the new covenant, take and drink, it's poured out for you. He then picks up the next cup. And this is the cup he talks about in Matthew 26, 29, when he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. See, what Jesus is saying in that verse is not that he's not going to ever drink wine again. Okay? It's very possible that when he rose again, surprise, sorry, spoiler alert, Jesus rises again in a few days. Uh, when Je This is a delayed reaction. Uh, <laughs> Jesus, it's very possible when Jesus rose again that he did drink wine, but he would not drink from this cup, this specific cup, the Hallel cup. 
He will not drink of the cup of thanksgiving again until he returns. This cup speaks of the future kingdom of God that is coming. But not only are these four cups important because they're tied to Pharaoh's decrees in Egypt, and not only are they important because they're tied to the promises that God gave his people when they were in bondage in Egypt, they're tied to the life of Christ. And nothing in Scripture is random or by coincidence, even the number of cups. See, biblically, the number four represents exile and redemption. And these cups also point to the four exiles that Israel would experience, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman exile. But they also point all the way back to Genesis. In our Heart for the House series we talked about in Genesis chapter 3, there are different forms of death that entered into the world when sin entered the world. When Adam and Eve sinned, when the fall happened, it wasn't just the promise of physical death. It was also the promise of emotional death, relational death, spiritual death, environmental death, and yes, of course, physical death entered the world in that moment. Jesus came as our Passover lamb, and he came to deal with this death or exile in our lives. He dealt with the spiritual death or exile when he took our sins on the cross, paying our punishment for his death. In Matthew 27, 46, when Jesus felt the full weight of our sin when he was on the cross, he cried out and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But we're not just spiritually exiled. We're also relationally exiled. Jesus redeemed that too. He redeemed our relational exile when He cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And on the cross, Jesus redeemed us from our emotional exile and death. Because of our sins, we are separated from God unable to live out the destiny that God has planned for us as His sons and daughters. John reflects on this when he wrote his Gospel. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave them the right to become children of God. Because of Christ's death, we have the opportunity to become God's children. Christ's blood pays the price for us to be adopted as sons and daughters of the living God. Jesus also redeemed the environmental death and exile that came with the fall in a somewhat unusual way when the soldiers placed that crown of thorns on His head. Matthew 27, 29 says, after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. See, as a result of the fall in Genesis 3, we know the ground is cursed, and that curse means that it would produce thorns. Jesus took that even to the cross and redeemed it for us. And on Sunday, we're going to explore the first fruits. We're going to talk about the physical death that Jesus redeemed at his resurrection. But as we move into our time of response, I want to ask you this question Are you experiencing death or exile in your life? Do you need to experience freedom from emotional exile? Do you need to experience freedom from relational death? Do you need to experience freedom from spiritual death or environmental death? I want to invite you to experience that freedom tonight. See, Jesus' death on the cross was for you. He died in your place, taking your punishment so that you could experience freedom, forgiveness, and redemption. And if you've not yet experienced that Tonight, I want to invite you to accept the gift of grace and forgiveness that Jesus is offering you. In a moment, as we sing 
Our staff and elders are going to be around the room, and I'll be up here in the front with Kelly. And I want to invite you, if you need to pray about something, if you're experiencing something in your life, maybe there's a relationship in your life that is strained. Maybe that relational death is what is pulling on your heartstrings right now. You know that person that you are separated from, exiled from, for whatever reason. And there's pain tied to that exile. And you need someone to pray with you about it. Maybe, maybe you're struggling through emotional death right now. Maybe the storm that is raging in your mind is masked by the smile that's on your face tonight. Maybe you need someone to pray with you because you are carrying such a weight and a burden. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. Maybe you are experiencing this spiritual death. Maybe you realize tonight that you are a sinner who is far from God. But you have a God in heaven who loves you so much, so much that he would send his son to die in your place. Scripture tells us the wages or penalty of sin is death. Because I have sinned, I deserve to die. Not a physical death, a spiritual death. But praise God, I don't have to. Because Jesus took that. And if that's you tonight and you want to talk to someone about what it means to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, what it means to surrender and accept that grace and forgiveness, there are people around the room who want to pray with you and talk with you about that. But if you're in the room and you're a born-again believer or you feel like everything's going good in life right now. I just want to encourage you to be grateful. There's no way you could possibly understand. There's no way I could possibly understand what Jesus did on the cross. It's inconceivable that he would do that for me. I want you to look at your, your little black cross again. You've written some sins down. As we sing, I want you to take your cross and, and take your little wooden stick and I want you to begin to just scrape through those sins. Just scratch through them. And underneath you'll see a rainbow begin to appear. I just want you to scratch off all that, all that black darkness, all of that sin, all that junk that Jesus took on the cross for you. And then when you're done, while we're singing, I want you to take your cross and I just want you to come lay it at the altar and spend a moment thanking God that you didn't have to pay for those things. Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to continue in worship today as I pray. God, we cannot possibly understand everything that you endured on our behalf. That you would love us enough that no matter what we did, you already paid for it with your blood. As we continue worshiping you tonight, as, as we scratch off those sins and we reveal light in a dark place of the cross. We're just so grateful that you would love us so much. That you would pay for us to be your sons and daughters. That you would extend grace and forgiveness even though we don't deserve it. And so we give this time to you, God, as an offering of thanksgiving and worship for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name.